Bruce, such a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. It's an honor. Something mind-blowing that I've learned from your work that I want to share with you is this idea that 95%, 95% of our life is not coming from our own individual wishes and desires. It's coming from the programming that we all get, including me, from other people in our life. And you've shared that this concept is something that most people don't and can't see that that programming is happening to them. Can you talk a little bit more about this? Why is it so hard to see that so much of our life is being run by the programming that's coming from outside instead of that's coming from inside? Okay. Well, you know, let's start with a very important scientific fact because everything's going to be predicated on this most important fact in the world. And that is the most valid science on this planet at this time is quantum physics. Now, most people go, that's a weird stuff and that's too crazy. But let's, I'm going to put it this way. It is the most truthful of all the sciences on the planet. And principle number one is the what I want to emphasize. And principle number one, since 1927 and emphasize over and over again over the years, is consciousness is creating our life experiences. Well, this becomes profoundly important because it says that your consciousness is uh, part of a co-creation of our life experiences, that everybody's consciousness is involved. And all of a sudden, it takes us out of a world where, oh, things happen to us, uh, into a world where we're engaged with things happening. Uh, and so we have to understand the role of this consciousness. Well, first of all, we start with a simple premise that we have to, let's connect the brain to, to the, the workerday world, and that is this. The brain is a computer. It's not like a computer. It is a computer. It has all the same functioning attributes as any of your desktop computers right out there right now. And I say, if you understand how your computer works, now I can give you an insight about how your mind works. Because uh, the mind is, a, is an expression of the brain. And the brain is the computer. And so when we're going to talk about the mind, I have to say all of a sudden, when you say the mind, everyone thinks, oh, there's one mind out there. And I go, no, no, each of us has two minds. And they're very different. And if you don't understand them right away, problem number one. Okay. The two minds, let's list them. Uh, the original version of the mind is called the subconscious mind. That subconscious means below awareness. It means it works without you even having to pay any attention to it, you know. So, for example, your heart's beating, your body temperature is being regulated. Uh, you can walk uh, without thinking about putting one foot in front of the other. It's just automatic. It works under the level, level of consciousness, subconscious, okay? The more recent addition is the new mind called the conscious mind, which is just behind your forehead right here, and that's uh, a, a mind that has your wishes and your desires in it. I say, what's the difference between the two? Subconscious mind is the equivalent of a hard drive that has programs in it. Conscious mind is the creator mind, which has access to the keyboard. So I can type in what I want into my computer, but it also can run with the program. Okay, so now I say, so what's the point? And the point is this. Yes, the subconscious mind, hard drive programs are in it. Uh, conscious mind's creative. But here's the fact where the problem comes from, and that is the conscious mind can do two things that are different. <laughs> it can look out your eyes, like looking out the windshield of the car, and you're driving your vehicle body, and you're the driver, and you're looking into the world, and you're driving where you want to go. Conscious mind, that's really pretty good, okay? And I say, well, that's that's the conscious mind that's taking us to wishes and desires. I go, yeah, but what else can a conscious mind do? And I go, oh, it can think. What the hell does that mean, think? I say, when the mind is thinking, it's not looking out. It's looking in. Because thoughts are inside. So the direction or the point of view of the conscious mind is based on, is it looking out the window at the world and paying attention? Or is it thinking? Because if it's thinking, then it's not looking out, it's looking in. A thought is on the inside, you know. And I say, so why is this important? Because it says that when you are thinking, you're not looking out at the world. Your, your thoughts are inside. I go, what if you're driving the car and you start thinking? I go, well, 
conscious mind is not looking out the window anymore. Uh, it's inside your head looking for whatever you're thinking about. I go, yeah, but who's driving the car? Oh, the subconscious mind, this is critical, is called autopilot. It's the one that if the conscious mind's busy, it's just like the pilot got out of the seat, the autopilot sits in, takes over. And the autopilot happens to be, as a computer, a million times more powerful than the computer running the conscious mind. So I say, so what's the point about all this? And I say, well, the subconscious mind's got programs in it, and it plays, uh, it takes over the control when you're not paying attention, like when you are thinking. I go, oh. I say, well, how much of the day are you thinking? I go, 95%. I go, what does that mean? I say, well, then it says, how much time are you actually in the driver's seat looking out the window and going towards your wishes and desires? I go, 5%. 5% is all you are moving toward where you want to go. I go, well, who's driving when I'm thinking? I go, the subconscious. It's got all the programs. It knows how to drive the car when you're thinking. You, you could be in thought and then all of a sudden start to come to attention, look out the window of your car as you've been driving and realize you haven't paid attention to the road for the last five or so minutes and you're still there. I go, yeah, subconscious, powerful computer took over and, and it drove it for you. So now here comes the point. Consciousness is creating our life experiences. Principle one, quantum physics. Consciousness is derived from the mind. Okay. But the mind can either be driven by the conscious creative mind or it could use the programs and then have the, you know, habit mind, so to speak. I go, well, 95% of the day you are thinking with your conscious mind. So that means 95% of the day your life is coming from the subconscious programs. Okay. And at only 5% are you actually looking out the window and going toward where you want to go in your life. And I say, well, here's where the problem is. I say, well, these are programs. I go, yeah, wh where did you get these programs? Oh, the first seven years of your life, and actually three months before you're born and the seven years of your life, your brain is evolving. It's not finished, finished doing its job yet. That consciousness is not a predominant activity of a child's brain at all that the main activity of a child's brain under age seven is theta, which is a vibration. I say vibration, I go, yeah, put wires on a person's head, electroencephalograph, read their brain function. It's vibration. There's a vibration for consciousness, alpha, and a higher one, beta. These are higher vibrations. That's where consciousness comes from. But a child under seven is not really into that level. It's at the lower level called theta. Theta, imagination. And that's how kids under seven mix real world, imaginary world. The broom is not a broom, it's a horse, you know, things like that. Uh, I say, yeah, that's theta. But what you don't recognize is this, theta is also hypnosis. And you go, so why, what, why should I have hypnosis for seven years? And the answer is simply this. In the older days, we'd go buy a computer and it didn't come with programs. You got a brand new computer, take it home, plug it in, push start, the screen lights up, it's booted up, and I say, now do something, you just bought a new computer. And you go, I can't. I say, what do you mean? I say, first you have to put programs in, then you can use the computer. So, oh, we put in how to surf the web, write a document, spreadsheet, art, blah, 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 these are programs. And I say, and once the programs are in, then you can actually uh, use a computer and put in what you want into the computer. And I go, a child's brain is a computer. It boots up. Last trimester of pregnancy, screen's on. But it cannot do anything until first it gets downloaded programs. I say, how does it get downloaded programs? I go, oh, the brain for the first seven years is in theta, which is hypnosis. I go, oh, how do you get programs? A baby, a kid can't go to school. They can't read a book. They can't do classroom stuff. I say, well, but they need the programs to get their computer going. I say, nature made the first seven years of hypnosis. How do you get a program when you're a child? You watch. Whatever you're watching is downloaded. It's a video recorder, everything. And I say, well, what do you watch? And I say, 
you need to be a member of a family and you need to be a member of a community and there are rules. There are all kinds of rules and each culture has different kinds of rules. And I say, well, you have to fit in. You have to learn the rules. And I go, a kid under seven, what are you going to take him to school? Can't do that. Ah, all the kid under seven has to do is watch. Just watch the parents. Watch what the man child does, what the woman child does. Watch what the community is doing. And you are observing their behavior, yeah, but you're also downloading it. Why? That's the programs of how to be a member of a family and how to be a member of a community. They're observable behaviors. And then you record those behaviors. Now they're programs. And they become part of your subconscious mechanism. I go, so cool. First seven years, I observe other people and download their behavior. And I go, well, this is really important uh, because that's how you're going to learn how to be the, you know, member of the family or whatever. I go, now here's a problem. The people that you're downloading behavior from don't necessarily have your wishes and desires in their behavior. They don't necessarily do what you want to do, but you copy them. And if they have a defect in their behavior, if they have a problem in their emotions or whatever behavior, you observed them, you downloaded that too. So when you downloaded them, you downloaded not just their behavior, but you downloaded all the emotional stuff that went with that behavior. And so guess what? The downloads are not you. There are other people. I go, so what? I go, well, once you're past age seven, you can, you know, control with the conscious mind. I go, yeah, you do control with the conscious mind. I go, yeah, but you also are thinking. I go, oh, God, that's takes away from the control. I go, how much? 95% of the day. I say, so what does that mean? I say, well, then the mind is controlling your life. Yep. 5% of the day from your wishes and desires, conscious mind, and 95% from the programs that you got from other people. And I say, oh, but what if I got negative programming? I did. My father and mother had a dysfunctional relationship. I observed my father to see how do men behave. I recorded his behavior. And then once I started to try and find a partner, when I played those programs I downloaded from him, all those partners ran away. Why? Because it was dysfunctional behavior and I downloaded it. I was operating from some bad programming. But the point was, why wouldn't I have seen that I was operating from bad programming? I go, okay, let's go back and recognize what was the fact. Why am I playing a program? Oh, because my conscious mind is thinking. I go, oh, and I say, and where is it paying attention? Or, you know, what is it paying attention to when it is thinking? I go, thoughts inside my head? Oh, it's not paying attention to what's going on outside. I go, no, no, it's not looking outside. Then I say, then why is the problem? I say, because the autopilot subconscious with the programs, when it kicks in and starts playing the program, like my father's behavior for relationships, it was playing because my conscious mind wasn't paying attention. So whatever was coming out in my behavior, I didn't see it, but everybody else did. And I say, what was the result? I couldn't get a relationship off the ground for nearly 50 years. <laughs> Why? Bad behavior. Did I see it? No. Did everybody else see it? Yes. Story that's been told a thousand times by me, now a thousand and one. You have a friend, you know your friend's behavior, and you know your friend's parent. One day you see your friend has the same behavior as the parent, and you're going to tell your friend. You're going to go, hey, Bill, you're just like your dad. Back away from Bill. I know what the answer is. You already heard the answer. The answer that Bill's going to say is very clearly, how can you compare me to my father? I'm nothing like my father. And everyone laughs because they've had this experience. And I go, what is the point of the story? This is why I'm telling it. Everybody else can see that Bill's behavior is like his father's. The only one who can't see it is Bill. Mm -hmm. And I say, and now I go, so what? And I go, you ready for this? We are all Bill. <laughs> Everybody, whoever you are. 95% of the day you are playing programs. These programs did not come from you, the basic ones. They came from 
downloading other people's behaviors. Up to 60% of the programs that we download, and that's the average number, 60% is higher in many cases, 60% of the programs that we download are dysfunctional, disempowering, and self-sabotaging behaviors. And you go, yeah, but if I was playing those, I would see them. I go, no, again, if you were playing them, it's because you're not paying attention. But everybody else will see them, and they will make a response to you. And I go, so now let's put this in perspective. I have a ability, according to quantum physics, to create the character and quality of my life. I'm the creator of my life. But I'm looking at my life and I say, it doesn't match what my wishes and desires are. The world is filled with chaos, crime, health problems, all stuff going on. It's like, I wouldn't create that. I go, not in your conscious mind. You would never create that but you're not creating from your conscious mind. Your life is being created from your subconscious programs, which are other people's behaviors, and you don't see it. Everybody else sees it. Uh, conclusion is very strong and very important. You look at your life with wishes and desires and say, I'm having trouble manifesting. I'm not getting what I want. And I say, but why not? And here's your answer. Because these people out here are messed with me, and that guy messed with me, and this guy interfered, and that guy caused a problem. And all of a sudden, you start to realize, oh, I'm a victim. And those people interfere with my life. And I go, okay, correction factor, clear the screen. What's the point? You were creating behavioral programs they were responding to. What was the point? You created the problem. No! I go, yeah, but you didn't see it. So can I blame you for it? No, 100% no. You cannot be blamed for the problem. You can become aware of the problem, and then you can be empowered to do something about that. So the issue is this. You're not creating the life you really desire. You're creating the life you've been programmed to create. And I go, here's a big problem. You don't even know what the programs are. I go, what do you mean? I say, well, you were being programmed before you were born for three months. You, you want to tell me what program you got? Oh, no, I don't know what that is. Okay, wait, wait. You were programmed a whole year from zero to one. Uh, you want to tell me about the program? No, I, I, I don't know. I don't remember. That. Okay, wait, wait. You were programmed a whole year from one to two. Uh, no, I don't remember the program. Okay, from two to three. Ah, I might remember something. <laughs> and I go, so what was the point? I say, at this moment... I'm telling you that you're really not creating the life you desire. You're creating the life you've been programmed to create. Unfortunately, you're not really aware of the programs because they were downloaded before you became conscious. And I say, whoa, that's a problem. I go, well, here's an interesting solution. 95% of your life is coming from the program. Your life is a printout of your program. So I say, you want to know what your programs are? I'm going to tell you right now. Here you go. You ready? The things you like that come into your life, they come in because you have programs to support those things. But, this is the wake up. But, 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 but. The things that you wish for and desire, but you have struggles to get there. You work hard. You sweat over it. You put a lot of effort. I'm going to make it happen. I'm working on it. I'm going to do it. I'm I'm creating. I'm going to work on it. I'm sweating over it. Why are you working so hard for that destination? Answer. Your program doesn't support it. And you're trying to override your program with effort. I go, nice try. But you're only using that consciously 5% of the day, so it's going to be real trouble to overcome some of those programs doing it that way. So the fact is this. Are you creating your life? Yes. Are you creating what you wish for and desire? Eh, 5%. Then what are you doing with the other 95%? Oh, you're creating a life that you've been programmed with. Oh, oh, yes. So guess what? You know the movie The Matrix? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's not science fiction, folks. The Matrix, <laughs> the Matrix is a documentary. What do you mean documentary? I said, what's the premise? Oh, the premise is everybody's been programmed. I go, well, that's a fact of life. 
Every human has been programmed. It's the way nature designs how you can become a member of a family and a community. Okay, and I go, so everybody's been programmed. I go, yeah. But, oh, in the movie, you could take a red pill and get out of the program. Oh, most of you actually have taken the red pill, and you did get out of the program. Not necessarily for a long time, but you stepped out. I said, what was that red pill? You ready? When you fell in love with somebody. Mm. I go, what do you mean? I go, your life was blah, 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 blah. You meet somebody. 24 hours later, your attitude is, oh, life's beautiful, man. I love life. <laughs> Food is great, you know, the music's great, the sex is wonderful, everything is great, I'm so in love. I go, what, how'd you do that after blah, 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 in just 24 hours? Science has recognized that when you fall in love, you stop thinking. You stay what is called mindful. You are what is called staying present. What was the point? You stopped thinking and you kept your consciousness right there in the front. Why? Well, if you've been waiting for this person your whole life and then they show up, this is not the time to think and disconnect. It's time to be there. So you stop thinking. Then what? You stop playing the program first time in your life. Stop playing it dead right out. I say, what happened? Well, now you're creating from what? Not subconscious. Creating from the conscious. What's that? Wishes and desires. So what is the honeymoon? Heaven on earth. Like, oh, guess what the jokey part here is? You could have that every day. It's your damn program that takes you away from it. It's not that you can't have it. All you have to do is stop playing the program and then you start, you got the control back again. And the issue about that is we can change those programs. And we can take power back by rewriting programs. What if your programs actually reflected the same thing that you have as wishes and desires in your conscious mind? Think about it for one second. What if my conscious mind's wishes and desires were also programs in my subconscious mind? You ready? Whether you're thinking or whether you're awake, uh, uh, guess what? you're going to be going to the same wishes and desires. All of a sudden it says, what does that mean? It says simply this. It says that when you stop thinking, you play the, uh, you are playing from wishes and desires. When you are thinking, you play from program. But if your program has the same wish and desire, then it doesn't make a difference if you're thinking or you're not thinking. Why? You're still going to the same place. And I say, so what would that be? Oh, I'll give you an example. I'm doing it right now. What am I doing? I couldn't get a relationship off the ground for nearly 50 years until I rewrote those dysfunctional programs that I got from my father. And once I rewrote them, I was now available to have a love experience. Mm. And I met my partner, Margaret, and guess what? 28 years of everyday honeymoon every day i always joke every stinking day is the honeymoon <laughs> and, and i love it and i go why i live in a world like you do it's crazy all that stuff is going on out there does it come into my particular life absolutely not why it's not in my creative vision none of that stuff is there Am I in the world? Yeah, but it's not necessarily not participating in all the other crazy people stuff. Why? Because those programs that would have engaged me have been rewritten. And now I have the power. And I say, so what did I do? Well, I chose honeymoon. Yeah, what was that? Wishes and desires. And look where I am right now. I got this wonderful young man who is so way ahead of the game in helping you. And I want to honor him so much for this because your program takes my messages but brings it to an audience that is important because this audience that you have here, Drew, is an audience of creative people who are looking to make a better life in a better world. 
and therefore I really want to acknowledge my appreciation for you doing these podcasts and, of course, acknowledge my thanks for letting me stand in and talk about it as well. <laughs> well, Bruce, that was, uh, uh, as you can see, I'm not speechless often, but I'm speechless <laughs> in this moment because I'm taking in and I'm really basking in the picture that you're painting for not just me, but the audience. You've painted a picture for our souls. And for those that are listening, which is everybody, you have taken us out of the thinking component and we've been absorbing and resonating with something that's deep down inside of all of us. It's been recognized and activated in this moment. So I wanna acknowledge you for taking us on that journey and the work that you've done because a key theme that's there for a lot of people in their life is they, you often hear this word or this phrase, you know, I want to break out of the rat race and, and people are sure. Some people might equate it to, you know, how they make money and earn a living and that sort of uh, corporate America environment that might be a starting place, but really it goes back to this theme that you just talked about, which is breaking free from the rat race is actually identifying how we are primarily not acting in this world. We're not acting, we're reacting. And what is reacting? Reacting is our programming that you just told us that is driving 95% of our daily actions that are there, or reactions rather. We think yeah. that they're actions, but so much of us are going about the world reacting from one thing to another and then honking at somebody in traffic. And then we turn on the news and we hear about something terrible happening and we take that energy into every next situation we happen. And then you wake up and you think, why am I not manifesting the life of my dreams? Well, you're still caught up in the programming. Hey guys, real quick, Drew here. If you like this interview and you want more content like this, hit the subscribe button and make sure to click the notification bell to get notified anytime I have a new video. Now back to today's episode. That is it. And it's also really important to understand this because my aspect of it wasn't so much the physics. I got into the physics, but I came from the biological point of view. And I, and I used to be a professor in a medical school. So uh, my work was really involved with a lot about health and understanding health. Uh, and it's really interesting because my work led me into that, that new field of science called epigenetics, which is control above the genes rather than being the victim of the genes as we have been programmed. It turns out we are in a healthcare crisis. It's always been this interesting belief, especially in the States, if you throw more money at it, we'll, we'll handle it. And it's interesting because we put more and more and more and more money into the healthcare system and the healthcare crisis is getting worse and worse and worse every day. Uh, and the significance is at some level, we have been misprogrammed, programmed, to believe that our health issues are tied up to our genetics and our, uh, you know, our heredity. Oh, there's cancer running in the family. Oh my God, I got a cancer gene or Alzheimer's gene or cardiac disease. Uh, and I say, this is a belief that your life is not in your control. This is a belief that you learn that the genes you inherited from your parents control you and you don't control them. So you start off with a victim mentality. Oh my God, there's cancer running in the family. I could get that cancer gene. I could get the cancer. Well, I'm going to give you the straightforward scientific facts right now, folks. Very simple. Number one, there's no gene that causes cancer. Mm. There's not one gene that causes cancer, meaning you have this gene, you get cancer. No, genes are correlated with cancer, meaning if the behavior is not in harmony, you can activate what is called a cancer gene and manifest a cancer. Did the cancer gene cause the cancer? I say, no, the cancer gene responded to the disharmony in that individual's life anger that was repressed or inability to express yourself, issues that, have, that are, are tearing you apart from the inside, more or less, are manifesting through a cancer. So, for example, especially women need to hear this because you know how programmed they are. It's like, oh, my God, if you get the breast cancer gene, you're going to, oh, my God, you're going to die of the breast cancer. I go, well, first of all, that story is 100% wrong. Why? Breast cancer genes don't cause breast cancer. 
95% of the women uh, that, uh, you know, are carrying these genes, uh, uh, they have the belief that, oh, my God, I, I can get cancer. I say, what's the vision of that? What's in your mind? I thought it was a picture of cancer. I go, get that out of your mind <laughs> because your mind's going to translate it into your biology through what science we call epigenetics. The point about it is this. 50% of the breast cancer gene carrying women never get the breast cancer. So what does that mean right away? Well, possession of the gene doesn't mean you get the cancer. Possession of the gene in disharmony, well, that will get you the cancer. And it turns out, here's a fact, less than 1%, less than 1% of disease on this planet is even connected to genetics. I go... Where's the healthcare crisis coming from? Mm. You ready for it? Here we go. You ready? 90% of illness is due to stress. Voila. That's the game. I say, why? Because the first stress, for example, for a woman is that I have a breast cancer gene. Okay, that's stress. <laughs> right, right away, you already started the game right there. But the simple reality is this, is what we know is that the bodies, 99% of them genetically came here in a good situation, never to have these kinds of problems. And then you say, then how come the healthcare crisis? And I say, because of stress. Should I, can I talk about stress here? Yeah, please. Absolutely. Audience would love it. Because I, I, I need to give you a reason, not just say, oh, stress is, a, I got, no, there's a reason why. And I say, well, why? What's the emphasis of stress? Threat. There's something is threatening you. And does it have to be life? No, it could be, yeah, I could get a threat against my life. I, I could get a, a threat against my advancement in the job. I could, I could be threatened about my relationship with that person over there. So threats don't have to be end of life. They're just things that interfere with where you want to go in this life. You want to do something. You want to be healthy. You want to be happy. You want to have a great job. Things get in the way of that. They cause stress, okay, because you're out of control. When you're out of control, stress takes us to a situation called fight or flight. You're facing a situation, you got, you know, fight or flight. You're either going to fight this damn thing or you're going to run from this damn thing. Actually, the third one is you f act with no action, just like you're dead. <laughs> just stand there. Don't respond. That's a, you know, so there's, the, the, those are the responses that you can have under stress. And I go, so yeah, but what does this translate to in the biology so you understand don't blame your biology for a health issue before you understand what I'm going to say. And here's what it is. There are three things that result from stress that cause illness. And here they are. First, let's go back to when did the stress response be, you know, when was it created? I go, well, 100,000 years ago when we were running away from a saber-toothed tiger because that was the threat. Okay, and I go, so, well, what was the uh, threat based on? Fight or flight. I say, yeah, and what do you use for fight or flight? Which, pancreas, gallbladder? No, arms and legs, man. <laughs> you need the arms and legs. Fight or flight, that's what we're going to do, okay? So the significance about this comes down to a simple understanding. It goes like this. What organs do you use for fight or flight? And the answer is arms and legs. I go, so what? And I say, but you need to energize them. I go, yes, you do, because you're going to run. You're going to need it. And I say, now put the picture together, because here comes the piece. What carries the energy? The blood. Ah! So when you're in fight or flight, running from a saber-toothed tiger, where do you think you want the blood to be concentrated in your body? Where? Okay, Let's go back to the answer. Arms and legs. I need them to run. So I say, now listen to this. It's right out of a textbook, physiology. When stress hormones are released into the system, the blood is preferentially sent to the arms and legs. Mm. I go, preferentially? Where, where the hell was the blood before? It was in the arms and legs. <laughs> It's mainly in the gut. Mm. I go, so what's the gut? It's energy. The blood is energizing the gut. To do what? I go, the gut's function is to take care of the body. 
clean it, filter it, repair it. All of the functions to maintain the biology of the body is run by the organs in the gut, okay? Then I say, but when the stress hormones are released into the body, guess what happens? The blood vessels in the gut squeeze shut. Mm. And I go, well, what happens if they squeeze shut? It causes the blood to be pushed to the outside of the body, arms and legs. And so I say, the first thing that happens when you're afraid is what? Butterflies in the stomach. Mm. The queasy, queasy feeling of fear. I go, what is it? You're actually feeling the blood vessel squeeze shut, pushing the blood, getting ready for you to run to save yourself, fight or flight, okay? So that's number one. When you're in a state of stress, you shut down the growth and maintenance of the body. Number two, the immune system protects you from internal threat. A saber-toothed tiger is an external threat. So I say, well, let's say you have a bacterial infection and you're being chased by a saber-toothed tiger. How would you split the energy? How, how much should you put into the immune system to fight the bacteria? And how much of the energy should you put in to run away from the tiger? You ready for the answer? The hell with the bacteria. If the tiger catches you, you don't have a problem with bacteria anymore. So what's the point? Stress hormones shut down the immune system as a function. And I go, let me show you how important it is. When they want to transplant an organ from person A to person B, they give the recipient stress hormones before the operation mm. so that when the transplant occurs, the, the recipient's immune system will not reject it. So I go, oh my God, stress hormones are so valuable in shutting off the immune system, they use it therapeutically. I go, okay, so now we have two things happening here. Fear, stress, shut down the gut, put the blood in the arms and legs. Two, shut down the immune system because I don't need to be concerned with the internal problem if the tiger's chasing me. Number three, and this is an important one, it shuts down the blood vessels of the forebrain, the thinking brain. I go, why? Because thinking is too slow when you need to make a reaction. When you need to make a response, a thought is like, uh, no, <laughs> you need to go. You need not thinking. You need to react, which is hindbrain. So when you squeeze the blood vessels in the forebrain shut, it pushes the blood to the hindbrain, gets you ready for fight or flight. So I say, well, this is an interesting uh, development in the human body. And I go, yes, it is. And I go, what was it designed for? To run away from the saber-toothed tiger. And I go, why is that important? Because if that's a chase, it might be 10 minutes. And if you escape, no more saber-toothed tiger, you go back into growth again. So the protection was only designed for a short period of time to escape the threat. Now I say, but today... The threats are 24-7, 365. And stress hormones are dripping into your body every day, every day interfering with your growth and maintenance of your body, interfering with your immune system, interfering with your intelligence. And then you look at why we have such a problem on this planet today, because not only are they sick, people are acting kind of stupid. Mm. And it's not that they're stupid. It's that the stress hormones make them a victim and they're looking for the reaction to get out. Not thinking, reacting. And therefore, they'll look for somebody else to take care of them. I'm a victim. Who, who's watching out for me? <laughs> and, and all of a sudden, you give up your power. Oh, yeah, we give up our power. If you were here during COVID, which I presume all of you were, <laughs> everybody gave up their power. Mm. They gave it up. They let the let a few people, a handful of people, determine the behavior of everybody on this planet. A handful of people said, put the mask on, keep away from each other, don't talk to each other, blah, 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 blah. And everybody's like, yeah, 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 yeah. And I said, you don't even know what happened, baby. I said, what? The entire human population was disempowered. Mm. Why? People only have power in community. And in COVID, zero community existed. 
And all of a sudden they go, whoa, you guys didn't even see the wool pull over your eyes. You were powerless during that period of time. And uh, But I think people wised up because they tried to introduce another COVID wave and people are like, yeah, sure, <laughs> it's gone, <laughs> you know? But the point about it was what? We are creating this and you have the power to have a honeymoon every day of your life. But to exercise that power, then you either A, have to stop thinking, stay mindful, or B, change the program. Those are two choices in your life right now. Do I need to change my health? I say, no, your health is a result of the program. One mm. percent, less than one percent of the people can go to the doctor and say, physically, I have some defect. You have to help me with this defect. Less than one percent. So what about the rest of us? Epigenetics, our consciousness has created our biological expression. Negative consciousness, negative biological expression. And we live in a world of stress and fear and anxiety. And I go, causes disease. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden it says, well, if you want to be healthy, then you have to recognize you are the creator. And uh, I, I will admit, yeah, less than 1% of you, there's a number of you that do have a, a biological, especially genetic issue that might be interfering with your life, but that's a very small percent, considering that 99% of you are not affected by that. <laughs> so where's your problem coming from? That's really what we come down to. Yeah, and it's, it's not that you're saying that, you know, you're not saying that, like, it's not important to work out or eat healthy or do these things. You're saying that oh. first, it's the programming that we address. And when we address the programming, those things start to change. Sometimes when we jump to the actions without addressing our programming, we fall backwards. You know, we're just gearing up towards the end of the year. We're coming up to a new year that's ahead. And it's natural. People make New Year's resolutions, other things like that. And we know the data on it. The vast majorities don't work because it can come maybe for some people. It will come in a moment of insight or a moment of even thinking, okay, I want to better my life. I want to achieve X, Y, and Z. I want to lose weight. I want to do this. But if the programming is not addressed from what I'm understanding from you, then you get what happens to most people, which is most of these resolutions, regardless of what time of year they're set, they're not successful because we haven't addressed the root programming. A hundred percent. This is the whole issue is because we're looking for, like my thought is going to change something. Yep. I'm going to get healthy. I go, while you're thinking that, are you doing anything to get healthy? I say, no, you're thinking. You're not even working on getting healthy. You're just thinking. You got to do something. The whole COVID story was based on the fact that everyone was afraid that the virus was so toxic, everybody was going to die. And yet, you know, 40% of the people, when they started doing testing, were found to be positive and they had no idea in their whole life experience that they were affected by anything. I go, what's the meaning of that? And I said, those people, their immune system was working really good, and they handle it like a flu. And what it is, it's a flu, okay? And I say, so what about the others? I say, the ones that got really sick, listen to this. They have what are called comorbidities. The ones that end up in a hospital, they were sick before the COVID got there. Most of them, 70-some percent, overweight, extremely obese. Another 70-so percent, Diabetes, type 2. Another group of people, the stress level and cardiac function has been impaired. This is before the virus showed up. I go, so what was the point? They were not healthy. You know, it's interesting. Um, people always blame wolves for, you know, killing animals and stuff like that. And then they, because farmers didn't like it because they killed the farm animals. But <laughs> what were they doing in nature? And I say, they were killing animals in nature, but they were in harmony with nature. I said, what do you mean? The wolves didn't pick the strongest, biggest animal in the herd with the biggest antlers <laughs> and say, that's the one I'm going to get. The wolves only picked out the weakest elements, those that were sick or were in, in some way, you know, their life was uh, compromised in some way. And they took out the weakest elements, which what did what? 
they were strengthening the herd. <laughs> that was really what the result was, okay? And I go, interesting, if I want to apply that to the COVID, I could say it was the wolf. And it said, if you were healthy, you went through it without any serious issue. If you were compromised, and this also affected the elderly. I'm not saying people didn't die, man. People died a lot. <laughs> but we blamed it on the COVID when we should have recognized, are we being healthy? And the answer is, nope. And a lot of people think, all you have to do is take the prescription drug and then you will be healthy. I go, nope, <laughs> because it's biology and everything is based on use it or lose it. Are we moving? Are we exercising? Are we doing anything with our bodies besides sitting at the desk and looking at the computer screen? Which means you're not using the rest of your body I goes, you know, there's a very simple principle. It's called use it or lose it. <laughs> I go, everyone go, oh, yeah, muscles. If you use them, they get big and strong. And then when you stop using them, they get weak again. Use it or lose it applies to every cell, tissue, and organ in your body. Every one. When you're not using something, the biology at some point goes, and why am I maintaining it? Its function is to take it apart. We fall apart because we fail to continue using the machinery of our bodies. Oh, I'm too old to do that. And I go, as soon as you said that, you already started. You, you already said, okay, I'm not doing stuff now because I'm old. I go, well, now you're going to get old for sure. Mm. You know? And it's really so important because health, it, it, is, it comes with a mechanism, but it's also involved with the maintenance of the mechanism. You know, you go to the junkyard and they got 100 cars stacked up over here. I said, is that, are these because they were poorly manufactured cars? I go, nah, maybe 1%, 2%, maybe. I said, but then what's the rest of them here for? Bad drivers. And all of a sudden I go, uh-huh, your body is a vehicle and you are the driver. How's your driver education? Huh. Did you learn how to take care of your vehicle? My new vehicle is a 1996 Nissan right now. That's my new one, okay? <laughs> and the point about it is if you get in, it's like, wow, it's like new in here, you know? Mm. And, and I take care of it. Why? I don't need to buy another car every couple of years. It's 96. I've had this how many years now? I take care of it. It takes care of me. Your body is a vehicle. Are you taking care of it? Or are you expecting it just to keep hanging on? I go, it will um, all be based on use it or lose it. Dementia, old age. And they say, oh, that's part of old age. I say, no, you know what it's part of? Lack of communication. That as people get older, they lose their social connections. They lose their social connections. They're not using the social part of that brain. And I go, then what happens? Use it or lose it. They lose it. Mm. The main main problem with dementia is lack of use of the brain. Which which you're saying also, well, let me ask you, that would also spill over if, if you're not using your social connections, you're also not walking with friends, you're also not working out with people, you're also not breaking bread in a healthy way with other people, you're more likely to drink alone, which all these habits are going to contribute to dementia. Well, it's just basically... Go back to what you were just understanding. Again, it was all based on a user or lose it attitude. And a lot of people uh, just say, I'm, once I'm too old, I will stop doing X. Yes. And I said, but, you know, it's fun. Uh, I'm too old to work that, out. I'm too old to walk. I'm too old to, you know, yeah. keep up with people. But you're saying that when you don't do those things, you become old. That's exactly. You're manifesting your vision. You are creator of your life. If your vision is you're too old, then you're telling your biology, I'm too old. And the biology will conform to manifest it. Let, let me get, let, you know, I should bring this in because it, Please. Uh, it's a nice piece of the story. And I said, what's the function of my mind? And here it is. You ready? To make coherence between my beliefs and my reality. Mm. Say that one more time. Now, Say that one more time. It's so very important. Yeah. The function of the mind is to create coherence between your beliefs and your reality. Mm. If I have a negative belief, then the function of the mind is to manifest a negative reality so my belief is right. 
I'm always right. If I believe I can't do it, then I can't do it because I believe it. <laughs> so you're saying the brain is a detective or the mind is a detective. It's always trying to prove you right for what you believe. Actually, well, it's taking your, your thought and turning it into chemistry and the chemistry matches the thought. So there's uh, a chemistry of love. Oh, that's great. When you have a picture of love and the mind, pictures in the mind, the brain will translate that into uh, dopamine, which is pleasure. That's why we love to be in love. Oxytocin, it'll turn it into oxytocin, which is bond with your lover. Uh, it, it causes the release of something called growth hormone, which does exactly what it says. So when you're in love, you're in pleasure, you're bonded, and you're healthy. That's what people, oh, see how in love they are. See how they glow. Uh, that glow is good health. I go, that's not an accident. That's chemistry. I go, but if you have a picture of fear, you release none of those chemicals into the body. You start to release stress hormones into the body as well as chemicals that control the immune system. And I say, that has a whole different body expression. And all of a sudden, so I say, well, what's the job here? The mind takes a picture translates it into chemistry, which then causes the body to manifest that picture physically. If it's a picture of health, then the function of the mind is to create the health that comes in your body, and I'm getting healthy, and I'm working on it, I'm making health, okay? Uh, and, and in contrast, it's like, oh, I don't feel good anymore. Oh, I got a pain in here. And I go, oh, okay. You want a pain in there? You can have a pain in there anytime you want. You want to die? You can die because you're going to believe you're supposed to die. Meaning, they've looked at a number of autopsies of people who died from cancer. Why? Because their doctor has told them they were going to die of cancer in so many months. And they die within some range of those months. And then they do the autopsy and find out they didn't die from the cancer. It wasn't enough cancer to kill them. Mm. What did they die from? The belief they were going to die. You know, uh, there's positive and negative belief. And uh, and people go, oh, positive belief that doesn't work. I was always thinking positive and it never worked. I go, well, yeah, but while you were thinking, of course, then you weren't creating either. So that didn't help right there. But the point about it was what? There's something called the placebo effect. That's a scientific reality. I go, what is it? Well, someone's sick with a strange illness, and the doctor says, oh, here's the newest, greatest medicine that ever came. That is just designed for your illness. And that person takes the medicine, they get better. And then they find out the medicine was a sugar pill. And we call that, oh, that's called the placebo. I said, I say, yeah, it is. I said, what healed the patient? Obviously, not the sugar pill. So I said, then what healed them? Their belief in the sugar pill. It wasn't the sugar pill. <clears throat> I say, oh, that's a positive belief. So placebo is a reflection of positive thinking. I go, yes, it is. And then I say, oh, well, that's cool. I say, you know, you want to ask me about negative thinking? Because nobody asks about negative thinking. I go, negative thinking is equally powerful as positive thinking, but it works in the opposite direction. Mm. A placebo can heal you of any disease. And a negative thinking called nocebo can cause any disease, including death. If you believe you're going to die and you really, really believe you're going to die, you will die. Mm. It's a belief system. Yeah, I have this quote from you that I pulled for the interview, and you, you said, the belief in the inevitability of aging, which is so important as we're everybody's talking about longevity and thinking about this term, the belief in the inevitability of aging is the most dangerous belief in the world it surely is one of the big one of the big ones you know and i'm trying i'm not going to go there if i can help it as long as i can i mean i'm just turning i'm going to go into 80 here but I, I haven't let it interfere with my ability to move and do work and go out and and do all the things i do uh and if i start to feel like a creaky back or something i don't go oh creaky back i have to live with it it's like no let's straighten this sucker out and let's get going and then it comes back <laughs> But if I stood there and said, oh, I guess that's the way it is, then I have committed the crime of <laughs> killing myself at that moment. Uh, and th that's called nocebo. And so the, the, it is a truth. There is a result of positive thinking, placebo, and there is a dire negative result for negative thinking called nocebo. Because you can actually die from the belief of dying, not even for any other reason other than the belief. So whether it's our health, 
or our general, because our programming impacts every aspect of our life. And some people yes. that are listening to my channel, my channel is mostly a health channel, but of course we talk about mindset, whether it's the mind, the body, the spirit, you know, or anything programming governs it all. And you yourself had said, as we all have, you inherited programming that you came into this world with. Can you share some of those some of that programming that shaped your early life and some of the negative consequences that kind of came from that. Well, of course, I already mentioned the fact that uh, in regard to understanding relationships, uh, uh, how does a, a male uh, in a male, you know, following my male teacher, my father, how do you create relationships? And I copied his behavior. And the first thing was, I couldn't get a relationship off the ground <laughs> with that. That is uh, really sucked. You know, hey, the honeymoon part worked always nice, though. The honeymoon part was I never played my father's behavior. As as it works for most people. Most people are usually, everything is great in the honeymoon part. But do you feel that part of that is, if I could interrupt, and I know some of my audience yeah, will please, be upset, please. upset but no. it's, I'm clarifying for me. Uh, do you feel that the honeymoon part, is that truly us operating from the conscious mind? Or is it our subconscious projecting what we believe the other person is and kind of coming back to this idea is that do you love me or do you love the thought of me so is it truly our conscious self or is it the subconscious that is sort of forecasting and projecting onto that person what we think we want them to be and we're falling in love with that idea which is very easy to do do you have any thoughts on that yeah, I do. I, I, I come across with a thought in physics called resonance. Resonance means if you get a vibration and something else has a similar vibration, if one starts to vibrate, it will activate the other one to vibrate. Okay. So if I have two guitars next to each other and they're both tuned the same and I pluck the A string on this guitar and the A note is going across and the other guitar was just sitting there. As the A vibration comes across in a consequence called resonance, it will activate the A string the same vibration on the other guitar, okay? When you understand resonance, it says that when you send out a vibration, it will activate something that is in harmony with that vibration, okay? So I go, so why is this important? I go, when we meet somebody, number one is this. We stop playing the programs that have been the cause of most of the problems in our life because now we're going to activate ourselves from the spirit. The spirit has the wishes and desires, and if you and another person are totally operating from spirit, there is no negative consequence in there. Not really. And the result is what? This beautiful harmony, this being in love. Life is great. Life is beautiful. Why? You're co-creating the same wishes and desires, okay? That came from the conscious mind. It's only when the subconscious programs return because one or both of them start thinking the behaviors that were never expressed in the relationship start to all of a sudden show up. And the person who is there responding to that vibration goes, oh, you know, oh, that's, that's a bad behavior. Bruce has a bad behavior. Now they have a choice. Do I want to sit, put up with this or do I want to go? And the answer first is, well, I'll put up with it. Why? Because the rest of it was pretty good. Then another bad vibe comes up and then another bad vibe. And every time another one comes up, the thought is, do I want to be here or not? And it leads to 50% of them in the end going, no, I don't want to be here. <laughs> and I said, where did it come from? I said, it was the subconscious that brought up the stuff that was not in harmony. It was the conscious that was generating harmony. Okay? So uh, I, I really go to the consequence of resonance. I say, why? What are you thinking? And I go, because the picture in your mind is going to be translated into chemistry, which is going to control your genetics and your behavior down below. But the idea that your mind is actually, actually activating inside your skull, because we can put wires on your skull and then read the action of the mind called EEG, leads us to believe, yeah, my thoughts are inside my head. Until we find out there's another device that reads brain function. It's called MEG, magnetoencephalograph. I go, so it reads brain function too. And I go, yeah, but what's different? The probe is out here. Because what, what does that mean? So stop for a minute and say, what the hell does that mean? And the answer is, I could read your thoughts out here. Guess what? 
Your thoughts are not contained in your head. You're broadcasting thoughts. So everybody's broadcasting thoughts. When you meet somebody, even before you communicate with them on any other level, it's the first thing you get of vibrations. And all of a sudden, you can start to feel a vibration about a person even before you even say hi to them. And it depends on the energy. Mm. And some energy will enhance your energy, good vibes. And that says, oh, that, that person's good in my life because I get more power with that person. But there are also people who generate what are called bad vibes, and they take away your life. And those are people you don't want to be with. And I go, this is the first most primal form of communication on the entire planet. And we as humans have sometimes been programmed, mainly many of us have been programmed not to go by your feelings. Listen to what the person has to say. And I go, big mistake. Always go with your feelings. <laughs> your feelings are the first means of communication of any biological organism it was always done by vibration. It wasn't done by language or vision or touch. It was always vibration. And vibration can either enhance your energy, which is called good vibes. There's a technical side to this in my lectures, but right now, the good vibes are something that's in harmony with you and comes together. And when they come together, it enhances your vitality. Mm. Bad vibes is just the opposite. Something that comes into your energy field that takes your energy and cancels it out, <laughs> which is life-threatening. That's why it's called bad vibes, okay? Primitive organisms... They don't talk to each other. They have vibes. You know, think about it. A snail comes out of an egg. There's no mother. There's no father. There's no teacher. It's thrown into the world. I say, how the hell does it know what to do? <laughs> and the answer is simple. There's only one gauge on the dashboard. It's energy. If the snail goes in this direction and the energy gets lower then the idea is program it and turn around and go in the other direction, okay? It reads the energy. If it comes to a plant and says, is this a good plant for me or not a good plant for me? It reads the vibes of the plant. Mm. <laughs> and it says, oh, this one is, I like this one, and this other plant, no, I, bad vibes, I don't like this one. So they eat the one. I say, what guided their whole damn life where they went and what they did? Vibes. There was no pre-program, no going to school, no learning, except for the idea is life is energy, and we have a, a, a device in our biology to always have us move toward more energy, because more energy means more life. Mm. So coming back to your story, how did you go on your journey from primarily being a reactionary byproduct of the programming that you grew up with. And we all have to have compassion for our ancestors and parents because, again, they were just byproducts of their own programming. And it got passed on from generation to a generation. And sure, they might be responsible, but there's no blame that has to be attached because no they were blame. Just, everybody's just doing the best they can. They right? didn't know. They didn't know. If you... Right? If you don't know, you you have no responsibility of knowing. Well, I mean, it goes to that. I'm, I'm not Christian, but one of my favorite phrases from that sort of world would be this idea of like, forgive them, Father, because they didn't know. That I use a lot that I've been using in my lectures because it's exactly what the point is. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Because what? They're operating from programs. They don't even see it. So obviously... Uh, are you going to blame them because their spirit is bad? Are you going to recognize that their programming is bad? There's two different things. Do they, in their spiritual world, want to be engaged the way you look at them as negative? No. That's their programming that made them negative. So your quote is what I always use, uh, not always lately, use a lot. Mm. Because it says, should I get mad at this person? I go, well, you want to get mad at them at a spiritual level? I go, no, they don't know what the hell they're doing. Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. It's their program that does that. So it's like, forgive them. They know not what they do. That's an absolute truth, 100%. And then I also add, but that doesn't mean you have to hang around with them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It doesn't mean that you have to put up with somebody. You can love somebody from a distance. Go away. It's funny, you know, because... It always used to be, oh, uh, love and hate were the opposites. I go, no, they're not opposite. And people go, what do you mean? I go, to hate somebody, you have to hold on to them. Mm. To love somebody, you have to hold on to them. 
if you hate somebody, you're not letting them go. <laughs> it's like you don't want them, let them go, you know? But hate is a holding on. It's a strange form of love because it requires to be bonded to that same individual. Whether it's a love individual or a hate individual, you've got to be bonded to them to, to express either of those two. So it's not love and hate are the opposite. It's love and fear are the opposites. Mm. Love is something you go to. Fear is something you go away from. Complete opposite. Well, on that topic of fear, as you went from programming yeah. and running, especially you said a lot of your you know, close relationships, intimate relationships, you couldn't get in your quotes, you couldn't get a relationship off the ground. Right. You know, it sounds like fear was part of that programming. Is that fair to say? Not fear is just inappropriate behavior that was linked to the program that instead of responding in a loving manner, or maybe I was an aggressive manner. Mm. It's like, oh, I didn't say, oh, I love you. So I'm like, get out of here. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay, that's a whole different. But their behaviors based on a stimulus that came in was, I, uh, you know, and the fact was it, it was interesting because when I met my partner, Margaret, both of us were quite aware of subconscious programming and how it interferes. What was relevant is when we had subconscious program would show up and I wouldn't see it, let's say, and I would say something that wasn't right in a sense of my programming. And she, in a normal relationship, normal, quote, uh, this would lead to an argument. Oh, you said this and you said that. Blah, 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 blah. In our relationship, it was what like, did you mean to say what you said? Wow. And then I'd be called to say, what did I say? Mm. And then it would come back. I go, no, that's not what I, <laughs> that's not what I meant. And this allowed us to say, let's change the program, and then you know put into an effect uh, one of the three major ways of changing the program. And so instead of going like most people, when these bad behaviors show up all of a sudden out of the subconscious, it leads to a argument or you know anger and stuff going like that. Uh, it, when it came to us, it was like, oh, wait, I don't want that one, you know, you know or uh, uh, she she might say something about, did you mean that? And then I would say, no, I don't want to say that. And then I would then have something I could write into my program and change that response to a more positive response. And then the result was what? After a while, you clear out <laughs> the really seriously bad ones and you replace them with really wonderful ones. And what does it mean? It says... Whether I'm paying attention or not, if she comes in and I'm still thinking, my response is going to be a good response. Why? Because it's coming from a good program, not the one my father gave me. What I love about that question, did you mean to say that, is that both of you in different ways, and I'm sure you both supported each other, you have interrupted the programming. You interrupted the programming with a simple question that actually allowed both you and the person who's listening to reset. Right. I don't yes. know if there's a specific term for that uh, program. Reprogram. Re a reprogram. reprogram. So that's a reprogram that's right yeah. there. Yeah. And is it fair to say that you went from programming in that moment with that simple question that led to awareness? You went from programming to a moment of reprogramming that led you now towards your conscious mind, which is moving more towards being governed by vibration. Is that fair? Well, thing no, it's say? always governed by vibration, but now it's going to be governed more by the positive vibration of enhanced energy versus a vibration that is more canceling of energy, which is a negative anger type of energy. Uh, the idea is what? Life is energy. If you're wasting your energy, you're wasting your life. And if you're using programs that actually uh, take energy and put it into heat, which is anger, uh, that's called wasted energy. Heat is wasted energy. When people get angry, they get hot. I go, well, that's, that's not a coincidence. Heat. I say, what's heat? Wasted energy. That's what anger is. Uh, and the idea is, well, what if I didn't? It's a stim. Everything is stimulus response. That's basically what works. If I get the stimulus and I got a program, I make a response. But if I get a stimulus and make the wrong program, then there's a choice if becoming aware of it to say, wait, I choose to have a different response. That's when you are reprogramming. So if the stimulus ever shows up, it doesn't engage the old one. It will go to a new program and pick that one. So this feels like a perfect place to go into those three avenues that you mentioned 
that allow for reprogramming to yeah. take place. Could you take us through that? Yeah, I'm going to try because we're going to. I'm going to try and make it short but sweet. Here we go. You ready? Yes. First of all, how'd you get the programs day one? I said the first seven years of programming, your mind was in theta, which was below consciousness, but it's a state of hypnosis. And I go, so what? And I go, well, look, every day when you're at work, you're using high vibration, beta focused consciousness. When you come home and you relax, you lower the vibration to alpha, which is called calm consciousness. When you're in bed, the moment you disconnect your sleep the moment you went from awake sleep you went from alpha into the next one called theta alpha was being conscious you're sleeping conscious is now disconnected you're not there you're in alpha or not alpha excuse me excuse me theta sorry you go from high beta calm alpha fall asleep theta and when you're in deep sleep it's another vibration lower called delta so it basically says this, every night when you go to bed, at the moment you are disconnecting from the reality, you've fallen asleep, you went from alpha into theta. So if you put earbuds on or earphones and you play a program just as you're going to bed, you know, just before you're falling asleep and you put these, put it into your ears, this program, and it's a program of self-help how to make better relationships, better health issues, blah, blah, better job, whatever kind of thing. Then recognize this. The moment you fell asleep, you left alpha, you don't hear what's coming in the earphones anymore. You're not there. I say, what's there? I go, theta. I go, yeah, but theta is subconscious. I go, yeah. You become uh, into theta, which is hypnosis. So every night when you go to bed, there's a short period after you disconnect from consciousness, where before you go into deep sleep delta, you're in a period called theta, and that's a state of hypnosis. So whatever's going to come in through the earphones or earbuds when you're going at that phase is not going into the conscious mind. You're sleeping. It's going into the subconscious mind, and you repeat this, and it becomes a program. That's how you do it. It's called self-hypnosis. Every night, just put the program in that you want to enhance in your life, self-help programs, okay? That was how you did programming in the first seven years. But you still learn programs after age seven. You learn how to drive a car. You learn how to play music instrument. You learned a job. You can do all these. These are habits. <laughs> a habit driving the car. You don't have to think about it. You know, play an instrument. If you know how to play it, you, you don't have to think about it. You can just do it. Habit. Play it. So I go, so what? I go, well, how'd you get new habits after age seven? Because you were not in theta. Repetition. Mm. You practice. You want to drive the car? Get in the car. Drive it. The more you drive the better your practice, the more capable you are of handling the vehicle. Practice. You want to play an instrument? Well, you actually have to practice. <laughs> and you practice and you practice. You want to play a sport? Oh, you have to practice and you practice and you practice. So I say, oh, then the second way of putting new programs in is through repetition, making new habit. Okay? And there, how, do I, how do you do that? I said, well, start behaving in a different way and make it like a movie script, like I'm a, I'm a, a new character. Let me write my, let me write my the character I want to be. And I say, well, then write that character and then live it as a movie script, like you're playing a character. And guess what? Play that character, and then after repeating it, you become that character. This happens in movies where when you have great actors, they don't just memorize the lines. They become the character. You know, Renee Zellweger plays in the, the Diary of Bridget Jones. Uh, when she took that role, Bridget Jones was 40 pounds heavier than Renee. And she became the character, Bridget Jones. Guess what? She gained 40 pounds and became Bridget Jones. And then guess what? The movie was over. She returned back to Renee Zellweger and lost the 40 pounds. Okay? What was the point? She became the character. Mm. Uh, Dustin Hoffman, one of the best actors in the world, he was playing a, a very depressive character, Willie Loman, and uh, I think, uh, is that Death of a Salesman? I think that might have been it. And I go, what was the point? 
he was so good at playing this depressed character that in the middle of his Broadway run, he actually had to check himself into a mental hospital. Wow. Because of his depression. And uh, where did he get it from? Practicing Willie Loman. Okay? So what's the point about this? Well, who do you want to be? Well, if you want to be something different, then write a script. Who am I? And then practice it. And practice makes habit. And if you practice something and it becomes habitual, then there's a point where you don't have to practice anymore, just like driving a car. You don't have to practice. Put the key and think about wherever the hell you want. You're off on the road without even thinking about the details. I go, yeah, habit. So the second way is habituation. Uh, there's a funny phrase, new agey thing goes, fake it till you make it. I always bring that up because it's kind of funny. I say, yeah. And the story behind it is simply this. You're not a happy person and your life is unhappy, unhappy. I say, but you want to be a happy person. Then I say, then here's what you do all day long. As many times as you can remember, you say to yourself, I am happy. I am happy. You could be miserable. I don't really care. You just have to say to yourself, I am happy. I am happy. I am happy. So what are you doing? Habituating. I am happy. And then there's a day where you wake up and you don't have to say it anymore. Why? You made a program by habituation. You'll wake up happy and you'll be happy. And that's called fake it till you make it. I love it. But that's the same idea. Could part of that also be asking like in this moment, what would a happy person be doing? Just like you were saying to your partner, right? You were saying like, did you mean to say that? You were asking sort of a very powerful question. Yeah. Because I know yeah. some people struggle. They're like, I, I want to feel happy. I am happy. I'm happy, but I don't. And then even just asking yourself, because because sometimes happiness comes from the body. So maybe in this moment, a happy person wouldn't be sitting, trying to figure out their problem while sitting. They might go for a walk right now and get some sunshine. Absolutely. Let me let me bring this up because it's really interesting. Because I was at one time a uh, maybe manic depressive or whatever you call it. Because I would have a part where if things didn't work right, it would almost be like a downhill spiral. That didn't work. Then this didn't work. Then that didn't work. And it's like oh. <laughs> and and uh, I knew when it was happening, it was like, oh, crap. You know, it's like, uh, it just doesn't feel right and all that. And I'll never forget, it. I was in the lab alone. And I spent the entire day trying to do this experiment that took over two hours just to set it up. Mm. And when I start the experiment, there would be a part where I'd, uh, you had to be very careful. Otherwise, it caused an auto reaction, which I didn't want. It happened three times. I spent two hours getting ready, started to stir this thing. Boom, it went. I had to start again two hours, do that. Boom, three times. At the end of that third time, and I ruined it. And I said, you're a you know, stupid idiot. You can't do anything right. I have somebody like standing on my shoulder giving me, you can't do it right. Look at that. You're failing. You're not good, blah, 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 blah. And I'm sitting here going, getting depressed about all this. And then I hear a voice. And there was nobody in the room, okay? Mm. And there's this voice just out here somewhere. And the voice said to me, and I love it, and the voice said, and I'll never forget it, it goes, don't you have anything better to do than to listen to this crap? <laughs> and I, thought, I stopped for one second. And I thought, I laughed at first because I thought it was kind of funny and nobody was there, which is even funnier. And then I just said to myself, yeah, sure. I'd rather go see a movie than listen to this stuff. And there was a newspaper. I picked it up, saw a movie. I said, I'm going. I went to the movie, got, enjoyed the movie, came out of the movie, no depression. Wow. And all of a sudden I go, whoa, what was the point? Stop. <laughs> Stop. All I had to do was have some voice just say, don't you have anything better to do? And the answer is anything. Go out for a walk, go out for a run, go play some music, go dance, go in the kitchen, make something, go out in the yard, do some garden. You can stop. And it's funny because there used to be a show before you were born. It was called Bob Newhart. And he played a psychologist. And I loved it because whoever the patients were, they came in, they sat on the other side of the desk, and said, oh, doc, blah, 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 blah. And then he would just look at him. And every time he'd say, just stop it. <laughs> that, was, that was his response to every psychological person that came in. Just stop it. And the fact was, that's all it took. It was just to just stop it. Because the next time I started to go in that direction, my mind started to laugh because I remembered. Don't I have anything better to do? I go, sure. Boom. Go do something else. And guess what? 
maybe after the third time, I, I never got there again. Because before I could ever get back to that, you know, self-depressive talk, my mind has a program now. Boom. Go change it. Let's go do something different. And guess what? No more depression. Mm. No more depression. Why? Depression is stewing and listening to yourself talk about all the negative stuff that's going on. Uh, uh, and there was a point that says, well, just stop it. <laughs> I laughed because it was like, really? Yeah. <laughs> Gone. Uh, 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 and people should know that. So let's say we've talked about two of them now. We talked about self-hypnosis. Yep. Theta. We talked about after age seven, repetition of a new habit. You want something new, then behave in that way and repeat it. It's practice. The more you practice it, the more it becomes a habit. Okay. The third one is, to me, the most exciting one because it's called energy psychology. I go, what, what does this have to do with what? I go... Conventional psychology is talk psychology. You talk over who did what to who and how your life unfolded and the positive and the negatives and you go blah, 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 blah. And I go, that's nice. They led you to have a program. Do I have to keep talking about how I got the program? I say, no, you forget how you got it. You already have the program. Mm. So the idea is this, and let's don't talk about history. It's not relevant. Let's talk about this moment forward. And the idea about it is what? Well, do you want this program? And the answer is no. Okay, well, let's change it. I go, how do you change it? I go, well, this new type of psychology, energy psychology, a different modality, not talk psychology. You don't go over history. You go future. What do you want? And you can re rewrite the program in that case. So the point about it is very interesting is this, is that it's a, energy psychology puts you in a, a super learning moment. I go, what's super learning? I say, a child under seven has super learning. They can experience something once and it'll be in their mind for the rest of their life. They just had one experience, boom, it's in there forever. If you can engage super learning, which you can, then you can just put a new program in, in minutes. <laughs> it's like the other two take time. The, this new energy psychology stuff is a miracle. It's actually, it, it, there's an old phrase, necessity is the mother of invention. We are destroying the planet with our behavior, and in order to survive, we all have to learn how to change our behavior as fast as we can. And so, yes, the uh, self-hypnosis, yeah, the practice part, uh, they work. They take a bit of time. Energy, psycho energy psychology can help you change a belief in a matter of minutes or less. You know, just minutes. Boom. Walk away. New. It's a super learning kind of thing. Just to let people know, there are many different ways uh, of engaging energy psychology. So on my website, very simple. You ready? Write it down in your head. BruceLipton.com. That's just simple. We'll put the link in the show notes too so people can click on it. Under resources, there's a place where you can look at uh, a whole variety of different versions or modalities of energy psychology. I give a paragraph to describe them and a website to connect with them. Look them over. Find one that you think sounds like interesting to you and give it a shot, you know? And is it something that you do with another person? Is it something that you do on your own? Is there is there a way to sort of uh, describe how you kind of engage with energy psychology yeah. as a modality? Well. Interesting enough, uh, the one that I that I have most experience with is, is called uh, Psyche. That's my personal one because that's the one I have most experience with, right? Uh, and yes, you, uh, I learned first by working with a, a, a person called a facilitator. They don't even need to go into your psychology. It's irrelevant. <laughs> it's like, where do you want to go? Not what happened. It's irrelevant, all that stuff. Uh, and uh, and you get into a super learning state and you can download a new behavior in minutes, okay? And you can do this with this facilitator. But once you learn a technique, uh, you can also learn to do it yourself. But it's a very critical situation because you can also fool yourself. <laughs> so you're thinking, oh yeah, I'm going to change something. It's like, nah, you're not necessarily, you know, you can do it yourself, but you have to let go of a lot of things and become at everything like fresh, not connected. So it has the answer, yeah, you can do it with somebody. And when you learn, you can also learn how to do it yourself. So uh, uh, there, uh, some of them are just like that, uh, tapping ones, for example. EFT is another example of that. 
uh, and I said these are very important. EFT is uh, just like the uh, voice that inter the EFT uh, emotional freedom technique. People yep. know it. It's also called tapping. I got, it's just like the voice I heard. When I heard the voice, it caused me to stop thinking in that negative thing going downhill. For a moment, I stopped. Why? I considered. Do, is there anything better I could do? I go, yeah. I, did I continue thinking? No. I, I found something better and moved off in the other direction. It's pattern interrupt. EFT is something like that as well. Because if you're caught up and you start to realize you're caught up and you say, oh, I got to do the tapping, guess what? The moment you start doing the tapping, you have to think differently than what the problem was. You have to, oh, now I'm tapping here, I'm tapping here. I say, what are you doing? You stop thinking for a moment. The Bob Newhart trick. Just stop it. <laughs> <laughs> just, just a quick question that I have here. Where do you think that that voice came from that you heard? Super conscious. That there's a level of us that is not the body part, but there's a level of us that's the broadcast. I look at the body as a television set that receives a broadcast. In physics, very simple word, the field is the source. Uh, in the world of psychology and new agey stuff and all that kind of stuff like that, it, it's like uh, um, <laughs> uh, the spirit. I go, yeah, but guess what? The word field in physics has the exact same definition as spirit. Invisible moving forces that influence the physical world. I go, yeah. Start to recognize that there is a spirit. It's real. It's quantum physics. It's not in the body. It's received by the body. The body's like a TV. You're looking at the Bruce show right now. My broadcast is coming in through some antennas called self-receptors on my cells point is you can watch the tv set and the tv breaks we say it's dead and i go yeah but is the broadcast still there of course the broadcast still there you get another tv and tune it in and you're back on again i go oh, that's called reincarnation no kidding yes no kidding reincarnation is a scientific understanding through quantum physics <laughs> jesus great I love it. So, uh, yeah, there, there's a point uh, uh, in understanding the nature of super consciousness and the, the idea of a disembodied uh, identity that's an energy field that could be called field or spirit. I said either term use the same definition. Uh, and that spirit is what you came in with. It has a lot of wisdom in it, too. And if you disconnect and you get into an intuitive state, frequently you've left this physical part and gone into the broadcast part where all kinds of information is available, the Akashic record they refer to it. It's quantum physics, so it's uh, really like, whoa, it's not new agey. I go, no, it's hard science. <laughs> if it's okay to ask you, do you, I don't even know if this is the proper way to phrase it, but do you believe in reincarnation or do you feel that it's there? Yeah. I certainly do. And, 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 and the exciting part about it is, from my perspective as a science guy, looking at it through cells and how the cells interact with the field and blah, 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 blah. Uh, it was interesting because I have to tell you something that was so profound when I understood it. And that was, I can't die. I'm not even in here. Uh, and I'll tell you, you know, what an amazing thing that does to, to our lives because the biggest fear that all humans have is that we know we're going to die. No other animal on the planet has any knowledge they're going to die. Only humans. That creates a great fear. And uh, it disempowers people, makes them victims, especially if somebody wants to sell them the resolution. Well, you're going to die, but we can sell you a piece of heaven. Okay. Uh, uh, the point about all this is, what if you really knew that you couldn't die? because you're not even in here. I can tell you what, it makes life so much more fun because the fear of death is always there 24 seven every day. And the idea is you may not think about it, but your biology is looking. It's always on guard. Why? The threat of losing your life takes tremendous amount of neurological processing in the background. If it finds something that's threatening, it'll bring it right up to the foreground, but it's checking everything all the time. 
to make sure that uh, we don't put ourselves in a threatening situation. Is it conscious? Nope, but it works all the time until you decide, I don't need to look for it anymore. And then guess what? Life is so much more easy. Guys, so many key moments and takeaways from today's interview. I want to share a few of my favorites. Ready? Let's jump in. These are all from Dr. Bruce Lipton. So the first one is that 95% of our life is not coming from our own individual wishes and desires. It's coming from our programming that we got from other people. Now, just as I said in the interview, and also as Bruce believes himself, it's not that we want to blame our parents or our caretakers or the figureheads that were responsible for raising us. So many of them were simply imprinting their own programming on us. It's the same programming that they got from the people that they were being taken care of. You know, I've had Dr. Gabor Mate on the podcast previously, and he said that there's a difference between responsibility and blame. We don't want to blame the people that gave us the programming. They didn't do it on purpose. They just didn't know. As Bruce would say, they were stuck in their programming, which is their subconscious patterning. But that doesn't mean that they can't be responsible. It doesn't mean that we can't acknowledge that they played a part in maybe our limited way of thinking, our limited sense of consciousness, our limited sense of limiting beliefs, the reasons that we have the insecurities that we do. But we can have that responsibility with a sense of grace. We can understand that truly, just like me and you mess up sometimes, they messed up. And yes, they didn't have the ability. They didn't have access to somebody like Dr. Bruce Lipton. They didn't have access to his interviews, his books, all the other great creators and educators that are out there. Maybe they lived it during a time that there wasn't even podcasts, there wasn't even YouTube. So we have to have some grace for them, knowing that they did the best that they knew how with the level of consciousness that they had. You know, Dr. Bruce Lipton is a big fan of Eckhart Tolle. I'm also a huge fan of Eckhart Tolle. The Power of Now is one of my favorite books. And this is one of the quotes from Eckhart is, people are always doing the best that they can with the level of consciousness that they had at the time that they showed up. How do we know this? Because it's reality. You know, another favorite quote of mine from Byron Katie, who I'm sure Bruce is a fan of too. I didn't get a chance to ask him. Uh, by the way, don't you just want to have a coffee with Bruce, sit down with him? It, it feels like this just, it, this incredible figurehead, this almost Socrates-like character in your life, the, 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 the patriarch, this, this incredible patriarch who wants to teach you and leave you with all these incredible wisdom and ideas. Anyways, that's just me fanboying on top of Bruce. But Bruce, I'm not sure if he's a fan of uh, Byron Katie, but I imagine he would. And Byron Katie has this quote. She says, anytime you argue with reality, you lose, but only 100% of the time. Why I love that quote is that it's a reminder that even though I feel wrong sometimes, even though I feel that my life would have ended up differently, the fact that it happened, which sometimes even could be my own mistake, I was doing the best that I knew at the time. And when it comes to our programming and this quote that Bruce has, 95% of our life is not coming from our own individual wishes and desires. It's coming from the programming from other people. This is how I started out this interview. We have to understand that we can see this, we can acknowledge it, but we don't need to blame the people who left us with this programming. So that was one of my key takeaways. Let's talk about another key moment from today's interview, key moment number two. And it's this idea that our past programming left unquestioned without awareness will 100% get in the way of manifesting the life that we want. You know, when I read Dr. Bruce Lipton's works and his books, which by the way, definitely pick up a copy. We have a link to his books below. You can get them on Amazon. Maybe even your local library would have them. He sold so many copies of these books. So probably your library would have it or you can request from it. When you read his work, you see that if you are having a hard time, which we all have sometimes, manifesting the life of your dreams, it's because your past programming is getting in the way. That subconscious mind is driving not only your belief systems, but also the actions that you end up taking or the actions that you don't end up taking. So if you're in a place where you resonate with that, if you're in a place where you feel 
that there's a gap between the life that you want and the life that you have, it's worthwhile to go and spend some time and do the work to dig into that past programming, which all this leads me to takeaway number three, which is reprogramming is the key to freedom. Reprogramming is the key to freedom. When Bruce is talking about reprogramming, what does he mean? Well, he broke it down for us in the interview and it's three things. It's hypnosis, practice, as well as energy psychology. Let's talk about hypnosis for a second. Hypnosis is there are self-guided audio books that you could listen to at night, especially as you wind down, maybe before bed, or some people use it to fall asleep. There's apps like the Calm app. Bruce on his website, we have the link in the show notes below, has a bunch of resources that are there. So it's truly programming your mind your subconscious mind, the deeper part of your mind that's listening at all these different wavelengths that we might not even be aware of. So hypnosis is a powerful tool to be able to do that. Practice, practice, which means when we're awake during the day, we're working on interrupting the programming. And we can do this through putting in effort. You know, I'm trying to significantly increase my lean muscle mass. It's been a big part of my focus as I've learned about how important lean muscle mass is for longevity. And so what do I do? Every week, I set a goal and I say, I'm gonna go to the gym X amount of times and I'm gonna do some strength training and I'm putting in the reps. Actually, I'm actually putting in the reps. I'm putting in the practice. Some weeks go well, some weeks don't go well. And you know, sometimes when I roll up to the gym because I grew up, I was a skinny Indian vegetarian kid growing up. I wasn't eating enough protein. I wasn't working out. And it's only recently when I turned 40 last year that I started putting significant energy into it. And there are days when I get to the gym where my old programming starts to take over. My old programming starts to take over and there'll be limiting beliefs that come, which is I'll be about to go to the gym and I'll say, I don't know what I'm doing today. Sure. Am I an expert? Am I a trainer? No, but I'm learning and I'm putting in the effort. And I'll even share mantras with myself to interrupt that old programming and patterns. I'll say things like, I'm here to put in the work and showing up is the first and most important thing that I can do today for my fitness goals. I'll even say mantras like, I am recreating my body in real time. It may not be the mantra that you use. I'm just giving you an example that combination of this pattern interrupt, which we talked about in the interview with Bruce, and putting in the practice and combining those two is part of how we recreate our reality. Maybe there's something that you're working on that you need to interrupt. Maybe there's something that you want to put into practice that you want to change in your life. And practice is one of the key ways to be able to do that, as Bruce has mentioned. Let's go to the third one, which I don't know a lot about and I'm excited to learn about. I'm going to go, go on Bruce's website. I'm going to check it out. It's called Energy Psychology. I'm not going to talk about it because I don't know anything about it, but I'm bringing it up because I'm so curious. If he's saying it's something worth checking out, it's something that I definitely want to check out. Let's talk about the next takeaway from today's interview. And it's this idea that life is energy. How much energy are you wasting today? Your entire life is energy. When you give energy to the news, especially legacy media, mainstream media, which Bruce would probably tell you to turn off. It's not that you can't be informed. There's plenty of ways to be informed, but realize that the news is truly the lowest common denominator of the human experience. That's a quote that I stole from a friend of mine, Dr. Reverend Michael Beckwith, based here in Los Angeles. Reverend Michael Beckwith says, the news is the lowest common denominator of the human experience, which means tell us everything today that's wrong in this world. That's what it means by the lowest common denominator of the human experience. We don't want that. We want the highest vibration of the human experience, which is why you're watching us on YouTube and which is why you're here and you're looking at great content because you want to transform your life. So put the pause on news or at least take a break from it. And especially at night when you're very vulnerable, and your mindset is preparing for sleep and your subconscious mind is gonna be very active at night and your body's repairing and doing all sorts of beautiful things, you don't wanna fall asleep to the news. You don't wanna fall asleep to the news because your mind is in a very vulnerable state. So how much time are we wasting every day? As Bruce mentioned, that really sat with me because there have been times where I've been addicted to the news. 
just like everybody else. I'm watching the train wreck that's unfolding, or I'm looking at a situation. I feel like, how the hell is this happening? And those are the moments that I have to take a step back, breathe and remind myself that, okay, I've got enough for the day. And by the way, this could also be social media. I need to invest my energy in changing my own reality and doing what I can do to focus on making the world a better place. And today that might mean just doing one nice thing, one kind thing, a random act of kindness for another human being. Today that might mean just telling my wife that I love her and making her a meal and giving her a break from making meals for me as a way to honor her for having a tough week or just simply to say, I love you. So we have to unplug ourselves from the matrix, which as you heard in today's interview, Bruce says, the matrix is not a movie, it's a documentary. We have to unplug ourselves from the matrix because our mind is always listening. And one way of doing that is not wasting energy on things that don't deserve it. We're all gonna do it, even me. The best of us are gonna do it, but we try to catch ourselves and say, what should I really be doing right now? You know, I don't love the word should, so let me rephrase that. What could I be doing right now with my energy? Or even just put your hand on your stomach or on your chest and say, how do I feel right now? Even if you're doom scrolling on social media or you're watching stuff, or you're you know, doom watching or binge watching on Netflix, put your hand on your chest and say, how do I feel right now? And listen to that energy inside and maybe you wanna do something else, something as simple as going for a walk, calling a friend, spending time with loved ones. We don't have to give into wasting energy. You know, I watched Bruce in another interview with one of my friends and he said, you wouldn't just walk down the street and write a check and give cash to somebody who was, uh, you know, smiling or just looked at you and said, hi, that would be a waste of energy to just constantly hand out money to all these things that didn't matter. And let alone, you wouldn't give money to something that wasn't deserving of it. And yet when you argue with reality, Going back to Byron Katie's quote, when you argue with reality, you lose, but only 100% of the time. When you waste your energy arguing with reality, you are basically taking hundreds of dollars and lighting it on fire. We don't wanna do that, which is why that part of the interview really stuck with me. Let's go to a couple more on today's interview that really stuck with me, ending with reincarnation. I have some really interesting thoughts on reincarnation that I wanna leave you with. Um, but before we get into that, the other quote that I want to share with you is less than 1% of our disease is connected to our genes. 99% of it is connected to lifestyle and stress. This is a key concept when we were talking about the health portion of today's podcast. And for those of you that are interested in longevity on my YouTube channel, this was a key concept that I was left with from Bruce because if we listen to the powers that be that are out there, they want to tell us that we are truly a victim to our genes, that there's not much that we can do. And Bruce is reminding us that there's so much that we can do. And not only there's so much we can do, but this idea that our genetics are the determination of the disease that we're going to end up with in the future or how long we're going to live and that there's nothing we can do to influence is hogwash. So when we remember this concept that 99% of it is connected to lifestyle and especially stress, it hopefully is empowering. It's empowering because of something called the law of responsibility. The law of responsibility says that if you had a hand in creating it, then you can have a hand in undoing it. So if we were a part of the stress, we, which also means our programming, if we were a part of creating this stress in our life or creating these bad lifestyle habits and decisions by re reaching for over-processed food, ultra-processed food, eating too many calories, not working out. If we cause that, that's actually a good thing because if we caused it, at least played a part in it, I'm not saying that we were the cause of it, but we played a part in it, that means that we can play a part in undoing it. This is the power of stepping out of a victim mindset, which is another concept that Bruce talked about on today's interview. When you stop being a victim, and you step into your power, you realize that your life is in your control. All right, couple more things, and then we're gonna talk about reincarnation, I promise. So one of them from Bruce was, the belief in the inevitability of aging is one of the most dangerous beliefs in the world. On my YouTube channel, I talk a lot about longevity. I interview some of the top experts on longevity. 
One of the things they all say is that your beliefs shape your actions. If you close your eyes right now for a moment and picture what somebody looks like in their 90s or in their 80s or in their 70s, and if your vision of somebody at these ages, who knows, maybe some of you watching today are that age. I know you are because you leave comments in the YouTube channel. Thank you for watching. If your vision is that somebody at that age, regardless of what age you are right now, is frail, is at a nursing home, is in a wheelchair, does not have their motor functions, is uh, needing a lot of assistance to just do normal and daily tasks. If that is your vision of what getting older looks like, your belief of getting older looks like, you will start to drive yourself in that direction, which is why it's so key. And YouTube is great for this, by the way. You can look up stories of individuals who are at these ages, right? Which are, by the way, very young, 70s young, my dad's 70, a little bit older than 70. My mom's turning, my mom just turned 70 last year. It's very young. They're very youthful. 80 is young. 90 is even young. When you step into the idea that you can totally transform your body and life and mind at any age. So if your idea of somebody who's 90 or 100 years old is somebody who's vibrant, who's walking around, who can lift heavy things, who can get up and walk without assistance, doesn't have a walker. If that's your belief of what aging looks like, that it's graceful aging, sure, we're all going to age, but it's graceful aging, it's empowering aging, it's powerful aging, then you're going to start heading in that direction. So find as many as examples as you can of what healthy aging looks like. There's plenty that are out there on YouTube and there's a bunch on my channel as well. Okay, to close us off here, I want to talk a little bit about reincarnation, which was the last place that we left off with the interview with Bruce. I asked him, Bruce, do you believe in reincarnation? And his answer might have surprised a lot of you. And he really ended up talking about this core idea, which was energy cannot be created nor destroyed. He didn't say that exactly, but he was talking about it. I pulled this from a quote from Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein said, energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be changed from one form to another. When I asked Bruce, does he believe in reincarnation? One of the things that he was saying is that what would happen if we knew to our core that we could never really die and that we were always here? What if you knew that to your core, regardless of your religious beliefs, your spiritual beliefs, or however you view the world or whatever you think happens after you die, what if you knew that to your core? Well, according to Bruce, that would give you a certain sense of peace because one of the deepest fears that humanity has is the fear of dying. In fact, Bruce says that's the number one fear that takes up so much of our mental energy in the background, even if we don't think we're thinking about it. We are thinking about it throughout the day. But if there's this part of you that realized or knew, this goes beyond beliefs, that knew to your core that you cannot die, that you will always be here and you always were here, how would that change your actions in the day? How would that change your stress levels in the day? You know, I personally do come from a faith tradition that believes in reincarnation. I grew up in the Hindu tradition and I love studying all different religions. And by the way, shout out to everybody who's here and anything that you believe in. I love people from all different backgrounds and religions. And I um, always love to have people on my podcast who have different belief systems and get a chance to talk with them and learn about them. But in my being raised in this tradition and background, and I don't identify as Hindu anymore, but I do still believe in reincarnation, one of the things that was there was this sense of knowing that even if reincarnation is not exactly real in the way that, oh, I die and I come back as another specific set in human being, it was this knowing that the energy, the soul, the atma, as we call it in the Hindu tradition uh, and the Jain tradition, will always exist. Now, I may not have a concept or the ability to be able to understand what that looks like, but I am not going anywhere in terms of who Drew truly is. Now, maybe in this lifetime, Drew is a physical body who has a beard and his hair is done in a particular way and looks a particular way and talks a particular way. I can't even imagine that when the time comes, hopefully, knock on wood, a long time from now, and I'm no longer here on this earth, I can't imagine 
how this energy would exist, but I know that it would exist. Now, that's my own personal beliefs that I want to share with you. I want to leave you with one more key takeaway about this idea of reincarnation, which was the last thing that Bruce went into. And I promise you, regardless of your spiritual or religious beliefs, this is going to be fascinating. It might even blow your mind. And it has something to do with the University of Virginia, specifically a division that they have there called the Division of Perceptual Studies. It's a department at the University of Virginia that was started in 1967 by a Dr. Stevenson. I'm going to read to you what this division is about. And I promise you, this is super interesting. The Division of Perceptual Studies is a highly productive university-based research group devoted to the investigation of phenomena that challenge mainstream scientific paradigms regarding the nature of human consciousness. This department research and the researchers in it objectively, scientifically and objectively document carefully, analyze data collected regarding extraordinary human experiences. Okay. What the hell are they talking about? Well, they're talking about a couple things in particular. One of the things they're talking about is what are called validated past life and reincarnation experiences. Now, somebody would say, how can you validate a reincarnation experience? Well, you can get close to it. And that's what this department does. And in particular, it's led by this doctor who's a psychiatrist. He's a board certified child psychiatrist. And he served as a medical director of the Child and Family Psychiatric Clinic for nine years. And he's the head of this division of perceptual studies. And his name is Dr. Jim Tucker. By the way, he's been on this podcast before. And my interview with him will blow your mind. We have a link to it below. And we'll probably put it as the end screen for us to watch at the end of this video. Now, let me tell you about Jim and his work there. Jim wrote a book. And that book is called life before life, children's memories of previous lives. This book is a collection of over 2,500 cases at the university of Virginia at this division that I was talking to you about that investigators have carefully studied since the foundation of this division in 1967 by Dr. Ian Stevenson. That's over 40 plus years ago. This found this department was set up. And in particular, there's a group of researchers that are there that are there. Uh, Ian Stevenson was the first one. And Dr. Jim Tucker is part of this group that's continued this work. And he works with a bunch of colleagues. And what they get is they get people to write to them from all over the world by writing articles and putting out newspaper ads and saying, does your child, especially at a young age, does your child around the ages of like, you know, six, four years old, six years old, eight years old, are they talking about a past life in detail that they swear they lived? That is something that they won't let go. If that's you as a parent, reach out to us because we have a group of researchers who will go and investigate this. Now, these kids, they're not thinking that they were Princess Diana or some very popular figure that are part of this book. And I've read this book. It's mind blowing. These kids are talking about people that lived in the past that they're describing in great detail that no child would ever know about. And most adults would never, never know the details of their story enough to say specifics to say that I was this individual, right? I'm getting goosebumps just talking about this. I want to tell you about one of the stories and one of the stories featured in the book. And Dr. Jim Tucker talks about this in detail in our interview. One of the stories is a child who was based somewhere in the Midwest whose mom wrote in and said, you know, my child has been obsessed about Broadway and, and like plays. And in particular, he, he would say in these moments where he was really relaxed, we'd be driving to school. He'd say, you know, mama, did you know I used to host plays and I would do theater and I made movies. And you know, in the beginning, the mom was listening and saying, okay, this is interesting. Like, all right, that's interesting. Let's just say the kid's name is Billy. Okay, Billy, that's interesting. And then, you know, a few weeks would pass by. And again, when Billy was really relaxed, maybe he's sitting at the park, just playing in the sand. He'd go to his mom and say, mom, you know, I used to make movies with this guy named Matt, just making this up. The guy whose name was not Matt, but it was something. And the kid actually said something like this. 
And the mom would say, okay, this is getting a little bit more specific. So she started writing these details down and remembering them. And every so often when he would talk about it, she would ask some questions, you know, but not go too deep into it. Oh, wow, what, what kind of movie? She just thought this was the child's imagination. And yet this was so much bigger than the child's imagination. The specifics, the detail that the child was sharing was beyond. So she finally wrote into this department at University of Virginia. This is an actual thing. We're going to put the link to the division in the show notes that's there. And we'll put the link to Jim Tucker's interview in the books. You guys got to watch this. She reached out to them finally and said, listen, I know you guys say you go and investigate these past life experiences. I have no idea if my child is one of them, but he is talking in detail. And sometimes he will cry. He will cry and he will beg me to take him to the library so he can look at more books on the idea of like old Westerns and, and, and movies and Broadway. And he'll talk about it in detail and stuff. So the University of Virginia got her email, not her email, actually it was a letter. And they wrote back to her and said, okay, we have investigators. We're going to look into this. And that's exactly what they did. They sat down with the child and they started asking him questions, putting together first a case history from his mom of what are the different facts that he brought up. So they say, okay, he wrote this fact. He wrote this fact, wrote this fact. Fast forward, because I don't want to ruin all the details for you. It's a mind blowing story. They went to the archives here in Los Angeles, where I'm located. They went to the motion picture archives and they took all the details of this child in specific said, and they went and they conducted interviews with people and they went and found like archival footage. And it turns out this kid, the life that he was describing, whether you believe this or not, the researchers came back with a deep sense of certainty that he was this specific individual who wasn't famous. But this guy, let's again, let's say his name was Tom, Tom, who was a stunt choreographer. I might've gotten the details wrong, but he used to be involved in Westerns and these weren't popular Westerns. This, we're not talking about Clint Eastwood and things like that. We're talking about old Westerns that nobody would know of. They're not even in your, your local, uh, you know, uh, Netflix, I was about to say Blockbuster, but nobody goes to Blockbuster anymore. They're not even there for you to be able to find them. And there's no way this kid could have known about these Westerns. They were things that nobody really knew about unless if you were working in sort of uh, the, the archives department at one of these uh, motion picture institutes. And the facts and the stories started adding up. And he would say that, you know, I used to make these Westerns with a guy named Matt. Well, there was this stunt choreographer. Again, I'm mixing up the details, but you get the idea. And he was working with a guy named Matt. And then that guy left and then he went to Broadway and he was, it wasn't Broadway. It was like off Broadway. So again, these are not very famous plays. And, and the child was describing that he was involved in making this theater. And there was a gentleman that was making these plays exactly the way that the child mentioned. And the mom would have never heard of it. There was no documentary about it. And these were all super obscure things. I don't have all the specifics, but you can see from my enthusiasm of talking about this, there was something that was there. So if you're curious, again, regardless of your beliefs on this topic, I highly recommend, if you like this interview with Bruce, watch this interview with Dr. Jim Tucker. It will blow your mind and it will take you down this rabbit hole of saying, even if I don't believe that this is true, I at least feel that there's something going on that I don't understand. And I'm curious about that. And that curiosity is the first stage to know that we are part of something much bigger. Maybe none of us fully understands it, but when we know it, it brings us a sense of peace in life. And that's what Bruce's message, I personally feel, is uh, you know, Bruce had to take off early from the interview, which is why I included this recap. I hope you found it enjoyable and that I wasn't just ranting on and on and on. I'm excited about not only this Jim Tucker interview that I hope you watch next, but I'm also excited about Bruce and some of my friends have done some incredible content with him. I want to give a shout out to a few interviews in particular. He's done three interviews below that you can click check out. One is with my friend, Lewis House. Another one is my, with my friend, Dr. Rungan Chatterjee. Another one is my friend, uh, Dr. Jeff Krasnow. If you want more Bruce uh, Lipton, Dr. Bruce Lipton, check out some of those interviews below. And I'll see you next week on The Drew Perot Show. Bruce, I just want to say this has been so powerful. Thank you so much for your time and sharing all your knowledge with our audience over here. You're an incredible orator, researcher, practitioner of these things, and you really truly awaken the spirit inside of all of us when you share. So thank you so much. 
Uh, we'll put the links for everything you mentioned in the show notes below. Uh, any final last words before you take off? No, I just really want to thank you for this opportunity to spout off some what I think are really interesting ways to look at the world and your place in this world. Because if you start to understand who you really are as a creator and not a victim, there's a world of change in front of you. Mm, beautifully said. Bruce, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you for this opportunity. Hey, YouTube, if you enjoyed what you just saw, keep watching for more great content on how to improve your brain and your life. There is this evidence that there is this continuation, that when we die or when our loved ones die, that it doesn't mean that it's the end. And it, it may continue on in very different ways.